You know, I've heard some worship teams describe their goal as putting the ball on the one yard line for the person giving the sermon. I think they took it into the end zone today. <laughs> they got it in the end zone. So all you need now is uh, an extra point, which um, for any team besides the Colts would be a sure thing. So <laughs> let's, let's hold on and see what happens with our extra point today. But great job. And if you're wondering what on earth does a song from the 80s have to do? By the way, who knows the group that sang that? The Fix, very good. Some of you are as old as I am. The Fix, that's right. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll think about how it makes a connection with our message this morning. As we get ready for that, would you join me in prayer? Lord, open our ears to hear what you speak to us so that we become more than listeners, so that what comes into us would find its way out. In Christ's name, amen. When Abraham Lincoln was president, he had a young aide who was an avid churchgoer. And a new pastor came to his church. He was a quite charismatic, a gifted orator. People from all around the area flocked to this church, no doubt many of them leaving their own churches to go to the newest phenomenon in their community. Every Monday morning, the aide would give a recap of the sermon to the president. He would always say, Mr. President, you must come with me to hear this person sometime. So finally, one week, probably just to uh, quit the badgering, the president said, okay, this coming Sunday, I will join you. That Sunday, the pews were packed. The preacher preached a very inspiring sermon. The aide could not wait to get into the presidential carriage for the ride back to the White House. They got in the carriage and right away said, what did you think? The president said, hmm, it was fine. The aide was a little disappointed. He said, well, 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 surely you were impressed with his eloquence, his insight into the scripture. By now, the president had a newspaper open. He didn't look up from the paper. He said, hmm, I suppose. So nothing is said for a while till the aide just couldn't stand it anymore. Mr. President, I can't help but feel you're disappointed. Do you mind my asking why? The president laid down the paper, took off his glasses, looked at the aide and said, because he didn't ask me to do anything. There's some speculation among historians whether or not Abraham Lincoln was a Christian. Many believe he was a theist, a believer in God without any specific focus on a religion. Regardless, Mr. Lincoln knew his scriptures and he was well acquainted with the teachings of Jesus. And perhaps he felt that the nation does not need another church packed with inter interested listeners, but a church with Christians who will go out and act on what they've heard. Maybe that is what caused Jesus one day to no doubt shock and probably disappoint people who had been listening to him when at the end of his teaching he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I tell you? We've started as of this past Wednesday for Ash Wednesday, a series in the season of Lent called The Questions Jesus Asks. The questions Jesus still asks us today. There, there are over 300 questions Jesus asks in the Gospels. So we're only considering just a few of them. But like any great leader and teacher, one understands that the most important lessons that stick with us are not the ones handed to us. They're the ones that are drawn out of us. And questions do that. Good questions draw out of us the lessons that we need to have. So what might Jesus want to draw out of you and me today with this question? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Do not do what I tell you. 
Well, just like Ash Wednesday, when Jesus asked the question, what are you looking for? Today's question also is not one Jesus asked of just anybody. The question today is directed to religious people, people who call Jesus Lord, people who might be found spending time in church, people like you and me. And Jesus is identifying what can be a gap between professed beliefs and actual behaviors. Kenda Creasy Dean identified this some years ago in her research at Princeton University as churches were first acknowledging the crisis of young people leaving the church, which we could be thankful. We've got young people in St. Luke's we've been able to see helping and leading in church, but more and more across the country, young people are leaving church. And she studied this matter. She studied youth who grew up in church, they didn't stay with church. And her research has been shocking for a lot of congregations. What she found is the reason that many young people don't stay with church is because of what they see in adults. People who are plenty religiously active, but they come to see a gap in the way that they live the beliefs that they profess in church. In her book, Almost Christian, she has a rather sharp quote for the church. What if the blasé religiosity of most American teenagers is not the result of poor communication, but the result of excellent communication of a watered-down gospel? So devoid of God's self-giving love in Jesus Christ, so immune to the sending love of the Holy Spirit, that it might not be Christianity at all. Listening alone can lead us to losing our faith. So Jesus' question very clearly is not calling us to be more religious. He's calling us to live something out. He's calling us to live out his way and his teachings. And what are those? As I mentioned, this question comes at the end of Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus preached on a hillside in the Galilee region. Luke's teaching that is very similar to Matthew's happens in a different geography. It's a flat level area, so it's nicknamed in Luke's Gospel, the Sermon on the Plain. Listen to some of the teachings of Jesus in this sermon. Love your enemy. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Give to everyone who asks of you. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. Do not judge. Forgive. Give to the poor. Do justice. Do not defraud anyone. Do not hate. Do the things that make for peace. Boy, that is a demanding way of living, isn't it? These teachings of Jesus are are not an easy thing to live out. They can be costly. An example of this is a story from Indiana judicial history. Back in 1977, there was a guy named Harry Palmer who lived in Elkhart, Indiana. He was a Vietnam War veteran and was having a hard time making ends meet, working multiple jobs, but he still could not provide for his family, and he succumbed to stealing. He committed several burglaries. At that time, there was a thing in place in Indiana law called mandatory sentencing. Judges did not take into account any of the circumstantial reasons for a crime, but a crime required a certain sentence, no matter what, in this case, burglary in Indiana meant minimum 10 years prison, maximum 20. Well, while Palmer was in jail, he became a Christian. He confessed to his crimes, and he appeared before Judge William Bontrager for sentencing. Now, Bontrager happened to be a Christian also. He grew up Amish 
and then became a part of the Church of the Brethren. Both faith traditions highly committed to living out the biblical mandate to be peacemakers. Well, during this same time that Palmer had a, a conversion experience, even as a Christian, Bontrager had something that was like a conversion experience where he just decided to take his faith to a new level, to live out the teachings of Jesus. So he heard this case. He knew that Palmer had no previous history, no criminal record. He looked at the situation he was in. He said that the mandatory sentencing would be a terrible thing. In fact, in one of his quotes in a magazine later, he said, mandatory sentences destroy the application of individual justice. Christ cared for the individual, so must we. So what he did was he reduced the sentence to one year of restitution. That Palmer did manual labor for one year for all of the victims after he met with them and agreed what he would do for them. Another little interesting factoid in this whole case is that the mandatory sentencing law in Indiana was overturned by the state legislature, but it did not go into effect until 18 days after Palmer had been arrested. So he served a year working for families, and at the end of the year, the victims were thrilled. The community saw a changed man. Everyone was happy. And this is where Paul Harvey would say, and now for the rest of the story. The prosecutor appealed. And the Supreme Court of the state of Indiana came back and said, no, 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 mandatory sentencing was in place. They ordered Bon Traeger to reissue the sentence to seven years to account for the time that he had already been in jail and the year of restitution. Seven years in prison. And Bon Traeger said, no, I refuse. I won't do it. The Supreme Court held Bontrager in contempt. They fined him and sentenced him to jail. So he re resigned his judgeship. That kept him from serving jail time. But his career as a judge was over. Another judge was assigned, and Palmer was sent to prison for seven more years. Von Traeger said, it just wasn't right. I couldn't obey the court and serve my God. They were in conflict. I had to take my stand. That story reminds me of a line from G.K. Chesterton. He said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. This way of Jesus, if it's taken seriously, is a difficult and challenging way. But we have to remember, Jesus doesn't call people to a comfortable life. He calls them to a compelling life. Maybe that is why Jesus compared the living out of his teachings to the building of a house that people who apply Jesus' teachings, it's like building a house where you take the time to dig the foundation out. You make sure it's solid. You put extra work into it so that when the floods come, the house stands strong. On the other hand, you don't do that work. And when the floods come, it washes away. This would have been a common sight in Israel in that time. People would have seen this all the time. When the spring floods come, the rivers swell, it hits property and houses, Some. Some stand firm and others that didn't. You go, well, they, they didn't put the time into building. I mean, if you want satisfaction, you will sacrifice dependability. But if you want dependability, you'll be willing to sacrifice convenience. All right, let me come clean with you. I don't like this question today. I'm not a fan of it. That's why I put it on the first Sunday in Lent. Get it out of the way now. The reason I don't like it 
is it feels judgy. It feels preachy. Why don't you do what I say, says Jesus. It's like you can feel the finger rising up off the page and pointing at you. I have this friend who says, Rob, my first wife used to point her finger at me all the time. And when you point your finger from the pulpit, I can't hear what you say anymore. (laughs) Well... None of us like having a finger pointed at us, do we? And this passage, this question of Jesus feels like a a pointed finger. I, I have read so many articles and sermons based on this passage. And you know what? Almost all of them are pointed finger messages. That's the trouble with the church today. Not enough Christians living out what Jesus teaches. That's why the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Oh, sermon after sermon after sermon. Then... I read this sermon by a guy named Wallace Hamilton. He was a great Methodist preacher, pastor back in the middle of the 20th century. He says, I'm so glad Jesus calls the two builders wise and foolish and not good and bad. He says, that's what religion does. We we put everybody into into these categories, good, bad, right, wrong, righteous, unrighteous, and that doesn't help anybody, but Jesus doesn't do it. He says, wise and foolish. He said, the reason I find it helpful is he's talking about what makes sense. What's wise? What is unwise? That's what Jesus is after here. when he says don't take the lord's name in vain it kind of feels judgy don't go around cursing don't turn the air blue with your words i mean honestly i think it would be kind of helpful today but many people say oh yeah that's just preachers being preachy again except that's not jesus point what he gets to in that teaching is let your yes be yes and your no be no just be honest just be straightforward it makes sense it's a better way to live Jesus says, don't commit adultery. Yes, it's a stand against illicit sexual behavior. That's valid. But Jesus' real point is something erodes in the foundation of our soul when we betray and when we hide, when we covet. Broken relationships occur. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't make sense. He says... When you do something nice for somebody, don't just do it for the people who can give you something nice back. Do it for the people who can't repay anything. Do it for the people no one else is looking after. It'll make you feel better. It'll make our world better. It just makes sense. That's what Jesus is saying. I mean, this was a game changer thought for me in this passage. That Jesus isn't pointing a finger at us. What he's, what he's really saying is, mind the gap. Any of you ever been on the underground in London? If you've ever been to London, the subway system, you know when the train pulls up to a station and the doors open and you're ready to leave, you hear that mechanical voice in a British accent, mind the gap. Because when you walk out, you look kind of straight ahead and you might miss there's a little gap between the train car and the plane. It's easy to trip, it's easy to fall. In a busy time of day, that could be a really ugly scene. Mind the gap. That's what Jesus is saying. Mind the gap that can occur in the religious life between what you believe and what becomes so easy to say week after week after week you you lose the self-awareness of am I living that way mind the gap because we all have gaps does anybody live the teachings of Jesus perfectly anybody here say I don't live them perfectly if so say that's me we got our bishop with us today. Bishop, do you live the words of Jesus perfectly? You don't have to answer that question. <laughs> How many of you would say me too? That was a chance right there. That's okay. <laughs> I don't live them perfectly. 
because we all have gaps. And you know what? Jesus, in the pattern of his teaching, does not show the habit of calling people to a higher life by making them feel worse than they already are. He doesn't do that. He calls people to a higher life with inspiration, but also reality. And what he's saying here applies to everybody. Just mind the gap. I need a religion that says to me, Rob, you need to mind your gap. I, I don't need a religion that just pats me on the back on Sunday and says, there, there, everything's fine. Rob, you just need to learn to love yourself better and sends me into a world with no clue how to apply what I've done to the realities of the world. I need a religion that gets more real than that. I need a religion that doesn't just agree with what I already think. I need a religion that will challenge me to think about the problems of our world and ask this question, what would Jesus do about that? What would Jesus say about that? I need a religion that will get personal and invasive if I'm going to be somebody who gets any better in this life. And that's what Jesus comes to do. He says, mind the gaps. So before we finish today, I want to offer a few thoughts that are helpful to me when it comes to minding my gaps. And if you're in a small group and you're going to be discussing this week, it might be helpful for you to, to think about with how you answer that question. Why do you call me Lord and not do the things I say? Why? What might be reasons for gaps? One of them might be comfort comfort you might say you know what the the reason I come to church is I just need some solace and some comfort for the pain of this world that's what I need and you know what that's legit we all need that but if that's all you ever get you might miss the call to do justice and to be a peacemaker and to face some hard and difficult things in life. Sometimes people say my need for comfort is because all I deal with in my life is turmoil. It's just turmoil everywhere. But understand, there is some comfort that doesn't come just from soothing words. There's some comfort that comes from doing the right things. Maybe it's not comfort. Maybe it's time. You're just busy. I mean, your plate is full. You're saying, Rob, if you had any clue how much it took for me just to get here today for one hour, and your hour's about to run up, so I'd hurry up, Rob, if I were you. I got things to do. <laughs> You're busy. You're just plain busy, and I get that. But let me ask you, is the busyness of your life going to take you where you want to go in life? Are you looking for meaning? Are you looking for purpose? Are you looking for joy? Is all of the busyness of life going to provide that for you? If not, this is just a moment to say, mind the gap. What do I need? Maybe something that causes us to have gaps is fear. We do know, we do know what Jesus calls for. The problem is we know what it'll mean if we do it. It's going to cost. Maybe it's going to cost friendships. Maybe it'll cost something else. But you know, cost works both ways. What's the cost of not doing? Judge Bontrager, after he left the bench, went to in, uh, Minneapolis and started working for the Mennonite Church, practicing restorative justice, helping with reconciliation with offenders and the people they wronged. He came back to Indiana for a period of time, and you know what he did? Bishop, you're going to love this one. He started working as a mediator for churches in conflict. I bet we got enough Methodist churches in Indiana conference to keep him busy for a while. <laughs> he just devoted his life to doing this thing to help bring people together. I bet he says... I feel so much more fulfilled in what I'm doing now 
than anything before. You know, uh, until we're willing to get to a place where we face the fear and let go of whatever that might mean, can we be open to embrace what something new might give us? Maybe another reason is just inattention. We, we, we've just never taken our faith that seriously. We love coming on Sunday, but our faith is kind of right there on an equal platform with everything else in life. It doesn't take a higher position. Now might be a good time to let it take a higher position. Maybe it's something other, something else. None of those are the reason, but you would say, but I can think of something. What would be your, your other? We started Ash Wednesday with Jesus' question, what are you looking for? And that's really the question behind all the other questions we consider in this series. When we talk about what we're looking for in life, the meaning, the purpose, the peace, today let's just consider how doing the things we believe is a step toward that. Two Sundays ago, we celebrated the life of Steve Claffey in our church. Steve Claffey was a powerful lawyer in Indianapolis for most of his career. He was recognized nationally for work that he did. I would have hated ever doing something where it got to a legal issue and the other person had Steve Clappy as their attorney. I would have like, okay, whatever you say, I'll give it to you now. Um, but Steve, throughout his life, would say yes to the things God asked him. He was active in the church, served in different capacities. And shortly before he retired, his wife Linda was a part of the launch team that created the Crooked Creek Food Pantry. Steve was still working. He was a cheerleader from the sidelines, but, but then he retired. And he started playing a lot of golf. I played golf with Steve one day and I learned two things about him. One, he got really good. I mean, I couldn't play with him anymore. It was too embarrassing. He's really, really good now. And number two, he wasn't overjoyed with it. I could tell. I mean, he was having fun, but he needed more. So when he was asked to be on the board of the food pantry, he said yes. And when the position opened up to be in more of a director of the food pantry, he said yes. And he came to life in a new way. There was no job he was unwilling to do at the food pantry. It wouldn't matter how dirty or grimy it was. He put in as many hours at the food pantry as he perhaps ever did as a lawyer. He worked all the time. And his wife Linda said, I never saw him smile so much. He knew the clients by name. He knew their stories. He knew their families. And doggone it, now he's gone. It just means there's a position open. Is God calling you? When it comes to advancing the kingdom of God and the cause of Christ, There's any number of positions always open. Let your willingness to do what Jesus says be the amen to this sermon.